So thank you very much. So first I want to thank the organizers of the meetup, uh, Max and Paul, and also all of you guys for coming over. Hi, Dennis. Um, this is the founder of our company. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a product that we're developing at X.AI. And first I want to say, just give you a little bit of the history of X.AI. So X.AI is a company that we uh, founded about a year ago. We've been doing serious data science on that maybe six to seven months already. We've gone through a Series A funding. I have collected about $10 million. And we are now a 30-man band, out of which 28 uh, are people are fully uh, devoted to uh, developing the product. So we're quite uh, deep into the game. So just to give you a little bit of the outline of this talk. So first, I'm going to give you, um, you know, overview of the product. Um, then I'll give you an overview of the actual architecture of the product itself. We're, we don't have a fully automated system yet. So I'll give you, I'll try to explain sort of the role of humans in our architecture. I'll talk about the different areas of uh, data science that we have in this project. Um, so there's different types of challenges, and I'll focus on how we handle time expressions in text. So it's a completely natural language processing domain. Then I'll show you the performance of our algos, say a few words about email classification, future work, and then I'll just wrap it up. So let's start. Um, <clears throat> so what is Amy? Amy is the thing that we're trying to build at X.AI, and it's essentially an automated scheduling assistant. Nothing else, nothing more ambitious than that, but also nothing less than that. So what does that mean? What does it mean to schedule meetings? Let's say that, for example, you wanted to schedule a meeting with him and him, and I was your personal assistant, say. Then I would need to know something about your calendar, sort of like your calendar availability, your preferences, and I would then compose a message to these two other people saying, hey, so-and-so wants to meet with you guys, propose some times, propose a location, and then you guys will get back to me, back to the system, and you would say, well, that time doesn't work, or that time does work, but that location doesn't work, etc." And so then the system needs to be able to understand your response and start this sort of negotiation with you. Right? And eventually we converge on a time and place for the meeting, and then that's it. The system needs to just send out a meeting invite to everybody. So that's what's kind of involved in scheduling meetings in a very, very simplistic description. It's the case that most meeting negotiations happen over email, at least in the domain, in the business domain or in the corporate domain. So we want to be both humble and focused. And so we don't want to expand the ability of this automated assistant beyond the domain of scheduling meetings. Uh, and we want to also stay in the domain of text, of e meetings that are scheduled over email, which, because, we're, because it becomes a singular focus uh, project, that limited space uh, actually helps us with the performance quite a bit, as I'll show later in the talk. I want to say a few words about what Amy is not. So Amy is not an app. It's not something that you download into your phone. It's not something that you download into your laptop. So it's also not something that you need to update whenever we have a new release or whenever we create a new feature. Amy is sort of a sort of invisible assistant that you interact with through email. And over time, it just learns your preferences. It learns what your calendar is like. And it learns how to interact with the people that you meet with. So in that sense, it's also a novel product in the sense that it has a novel way of onboarding. The way that you onboard Amy is simply, next time you want to schedule a meeting, you just CC Amy. So Amy has an email address, you just CC Amy and you tell Amy, hey Amy, please schedule a meeting with so-and-so for some time next week. And then Amy just takes it from there. So of course Amy will 
start asking, nagging you to give her access to your calendar because that actually helps us, hel helps her know, make the informed decisions about you know your available spots, your preferences, etc. Et and it's a type of system that the more information you give it, the better the service it provides. So in that sense, it's similar to say like Spotify or Pandora or something where you want to tell it your preferences, you want to tell it things about you, because then it just does a better job basically. Okay, so that's the product uh, intro. You can think of Amy as a sort of conversation model where we said the entry point was an email. Somebody sent an email requesting, say, I want to meet with so-and-so. And so the first thing is that Amy needs to recognize what that email is about, needs to, able to, needs to be able to extract information from that email, and then sort of understand what the meeting scenario is at that point what information we have, what information we don't have. And once Amy understands the meeting scenario, then she takes an action. And the action can be sent an email to each of the participants with whatever info, then those guys reply, and then the conversation model keeps on going until um, sort of the meeting is resolved. So we think of it as a change of state system, where the only thing that we need to determine is what the scenario of the meeting actually is, right? Once we know the scenario of the meeting, we don't really care about how we got there. It's a, it becomes a deterministic system. In that sense, it's, it's basically a pure Markov process. We don't care about the history of how we got there. Once we know where we are, we know what action we need to take. And so then the name of the game is determining what the meeting, the current meeting scenario is. So for example, Going back to the same process again, we get an email from somebody requesting a meeting. We check, does the person exist in our database? Do we have the participants? Do you propose a time, etc., etc. And all those pieces of information determine, give us sufficient information to know what the meeting scenario is. And then Amy just makes a deterministic action based on that. Amy follows three directives. The first one is that she's always trying to minimize ambiguity. So she's, every action that she makes has the intent of minimizing the number of ping pongs. So converging on the meeting as quickly as possible. The second is that she's writing things, she's communicating with people in such a way as to facilitate as much as possible understanding their answers, right? So she's trying to make her life easier. And the third one is that she's trying to make everyone involved as happy as possible. So she's trying to take everyone's sort of preferences into account so that the meeting that she schedules at the end hasn't just filled an empty slot in people's calendars, but has actually filled the optimal you know, empty slot. So as you can imagine, being a machine learning crowd, this is a rather challenging task, right? It involves classification, information extraction of various sorts. Just understanding human language is difficult. So in the time and with the data we have, the system's not yet fully automated. So in this slide, I want to kind of describe that hybrid system, which is a temporary system where, and, and the way that humans play a role in the system at right now, with the caveat that we're moving very quickly towards a fully automated system, and there's no way that we can scale or that we can conceive scaling with any human involvement in this chain. So the way we conceive it is an email comes in, we need to answer maybe 100 questions about that email to determine what meeting scenario we're in. We do try to answer all those questions through machine learning, but some of those questions, for some of those questions, we have higher or lower confidence levels. And so for those where the confidence level is not high enough, they get pipelined to someone in our team who then checks the machine answer, corrects the machine answer if it's wrong, and sort of gives that feedback to the system, increases our data, our annotated data set, and so then the machine gets better at predicting that, you know, that the answer to that question in the future, right? So if you have to resolve maybe 100 different questions, and for a given scenario you were able to do 70 of them, a month from now you'll be able to do 80, and three months from now 90, and eventually the goal is to go to, we can answer all 100 of them. Okay, so that's sort of the product overview. Now let's dive a little bit deeper into the actual uh, 
nitty gritty of what we need to do in terms of uh, machine learning. So I'll go through the same sequence that I've already repeated a couple of times. Somebody writes us an, an email. This is an actual, by the way, this is an actual conversation with Amy, um, but it's a conversation, I'm not really revealing any sensitive info because it's basically our founder trying to meet with one of the co-founders. So Dennis is asking Amy to coordinate a meeting with Matt on Monday. Amy needs to recognize that this is, the email comes in, she needs to recognize that this is a new meeting request. That's a sort of classification task. She needs to then identify information within the text, so people, locations, times, etc. She will notice that in this case there was no location proposed, but she knows from Dennis's uh, preferences and calendar that he has a preferred location, which is his office. Right? So she's able, she has sufficient information to actually build a template, which she then sends to Matt. Hey Matt, Dennis wants to meet with you, how about these times on Monday uh, in his office? And then Matt responds and says, 1-2 works. We need to recognize that 1-2 is a temporal expression that refers to a start time plus a duration, and that the email is actually accepting something that we proposed. So you can see there's three basic data science tasks. One is understanding the calendar and the preferences of the user. The other is classifying emails. And the third one is an information extraction model uh, for text. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about all the different information extraction models and, and classification uh, algorithms that we have, because there's just no time for that. But I will describe in some detail how we handle temporal expressions, which is in itself, I, I find a pretty fascinating thing. So <clears throat> by looking at many, many emails, um, we notice that there's four challenges to extracting times automatically from text in emails. The first challenge is that, is that detection, just detecting them. That's particularly difficult in emails because in emails people have absolute disregard for grammar, right? So people will say, like that, the example before, one dash two, how is that a time, right? Or let's meet at 230 tomorrow, which means two. Anyway, just a side note, even doing simple things like sentence parsing in emails is hard because people will sort of like artificially break sentences just to make the emails rectangular. It's just a very annoying thing. Anyway, so the detection problem. Let's say that you found Tuesday and the number four you identified as temporal expressions. Then comes the type problem. What type of temporal expressions are these? Are they days of weeks, times, intersections, offsets? After that comes a coreference problem. So you found two different temporal expressions in the sentence. They're in different spots of your text. But now you need to somehow ascertain that they belong to the same time expression. So you need to somehow be able to associate them and build a more complex temporal expression from the pieces. And then finally comes the hardest problem, which is, yes, you have your, your, your temporal expression. Now you need to resolve it to an actual time. Because if the person said 4 PM works, you need to know that 4 p.m. means year 2015, February 25th at 17 hours UTC. And that's the hard part. So before I go into how we tackle each of these problems, let me just say a few words about, about our data set. So pretty early on, we um, undertook a campaign to go through and annotate by hand a significant fraction of our data set. Uh, and, we, and that's a current ongoing campaign. And so we have a significant data set of emails where we have fully annotated times, people, locations, the intent of the email, and not just annotated by, hey, this word is temporal expression, but actually resolving it, resolving the people to what they are, etc. So that's our corpus. But of course, we have many different cases that we need to handle, and some of which are more frequent than others. So even though we have a significant data set, there are some cases for which we are still lacking uh, statistics. But that's changing. So let me show you an actual plot that describes our data. This is the raw email traffic through our system. So the blue line is the number of emails that goes through our system as a function of time. Each dot here is the number of emails in a given day. 
right? And so the x-axis is just time. The y-axis is the number of years, uh, <laughs> the number of um, emails, but uh, I don't necessarily want to reveal what the actual volume that we have. But there's some interesting characteristics about this already. You can see that it's very rich in structure. Uh, oh, and by the way, the red line corresponds to the number of emails that have temporal expressions in them. As you can see, we started recording that some, sometime in mid-July. So you can see, for example, that the email traffic has a strong dependence on the day of week. It actually drops dramatically uh, in the weekend because people just don't schedule meetings in weekends. Um, there's some structure that you can see already at the day of week level. So people tend to schedule more meetings on Mondays and on Fridays because they're planning either the rest of the week or the next week. We are still at the beta stage. So that means that we have a fixed number of users. And something very beautiful about this plot is that when we onboarded uh, a bunch of our beta users at the beginning, you can see that the traffic more or less stays constant, which means that people that use the system stay and they keep on using it because they like it, because it works for them. And so you can see the sort of step functions that correspond to sort of onboarding campaigns uh, that we've undertaken through time. There's a nice feature here, which is the end of December, where you see this massive drop and that corresponds to people just going on vacation and canceling a bunch of meetings and um, rescheduling, etc. So one lesson from this is that, and it's a very trivial and basic lesson, is that we actually have um, a dependence. So our data set, the properties of our data set, the relative frequencies of the things inside our data set have a strong time dependence. Whenever there's some event, like there's some, we're close to some vacation, or a blizzard comes into New York, or there's a hurricane in Miami, or whatever, we actually see that our data set changes. So that means that all the machine learning that we do shouldn't really depend on those things that are sensitive to this type of events. So we need to be very careful about the way we select our features, right? Because it's that principle that you should apply your machine learning on things that have the same probability distributions as the thing that you trained on. And so if your probability distribution suddenly change, then your prediction is not, not going to be as good. OK. So how do we tackle each of the challenges uh, associated to time entities? So first, the detection challenge. Um, and I know this is a machine learning crowd. So maybe you might not like what I'm going to say, but a rule-based approach actually works very well. Um, temporal expressions are structured enough that a set of rejects rules actually outperforms most machine learning, that at least all the machine learning approaches that I've seen. So we do take a rejects-based approach um, to detecting times. We complement it with parts of speech tagging. So in some cases where the thing is ambiguous, like for example, word fall, F-A-L-L, -L, that could be a verb or a noun or like a season of the year, but it could also, also be a verb. So for those ambiguous cases, we just run like conditional random fields, get parts of speech, and double check that this thing's not a verb. Uh, but most of the time, we just use pure uh, tokens rejects, and that actually works quite well. So we've detected the time time entities. Now we need to resolve. We need to understand what that those time entities are. What type of a time entity is it? A day of week? A time of day? Is it some sort of intersect, offset, etc.? And after looking at many many emails, we realize that there's a finite cases number of cases that we need to learn how to handle. Um, and so yeah, we have that those set of cases and we define a set of operations that can do various things with these uh, different types of times. Um, and it, applying those operations on those types of times always results in a new type which is inside the set of types that we have. So it's a closed algebra. And that actually makes, makes it good coding practice in a sense. Um, and then the coreference model. So this thing of having different types of times helps with the coreference model. Uh, and now we actually have very rudimentary approaches, which is we grab a sentence, all the time entities inside that sentence. We compare them through these operators that we have, which tell us where, whether we can merge things or not. And if we can, we actually merge them. So an example of that is you have 1 PM time constraint. Tuesday is a day of week object. Operator, compare them. Can you merge them? Yes. Then you create a new object called weekday time, which is Tuesday, 1 PM. And then comes the resolution. Uh -huh. uh, 
uh, yes, to some extent. We have, we, it's not, it's not, no, it's not a part of speech tagging, but we add a layer of logical rules on top of it. That's how we handle that type of thing. Or like before this, except that, or this type of thing. But it gets, it gets pretty complicated. Uh, and then the last problem, which is resolving the actual temporal expression into a time. This is how we handle that. And I know this looks a little bit abstract, and there's no, there's very few words in here, but this is actually the main message of this talk. So if you, wanna, if you were going to take anything from this talk, there would be this slide. And so what we've learned is that the way to handle a very complex machine learning task that has a lot of composite different pieces that some talk to each other, some are independent, etc., is to actually break it down into a set of very simple binary decisions. So let me give an analogy. Um, a good analogy of this would be building a car. So imagine in the 19th century or 18th century, I don't know, when cars started to get built, you had um, maybe three or four engineers that understood everything about the car, and they built the whole car themselves, right? And they built the first prototype. And maybe it took them like seven, eight months, 10 months to build it. But now, now once you know what the car is, you can actually break the design and the building of the car into an assembly line, where now you have a thousand steps that are very trivial. And so maybe step 1,000 or 705 is just some guy who needs to get this screw and put it in this place. And that guy doesn't, that's the only task he needs to do. And he doesn't really know what else happened in the chain. He may not even know that he's building a car. And he doesn't know how the thing got there. And the simplicity of that task the fact that you broke it into a set of a sequence of simple tasks is what allows you to then substitute um, those humans with robots. There's no way you could build a robot nowadays that could, the robot itself could build the whole car. But you can build a thousand robots that have performed very simple tasks. And then at the end of the sequence, you get a car. So that's kind of the concept, the concept here. Let me just dive and show you an actual, sort of an actual example. So you have a time entity that comes in from the top. You have no idea where it came from or why or what it is. And you just need to answer this very simple question. Is the email where the time entity is, is it responding to an email where we propose times? Yes or no? And if the answer is yes, then the next binary question, which is very simple to respond, is does that time match any of the times that we proposed? Yes or no? You don't need to know anything else, right? If it does, then you know that time is referencing one of the times we proposed, and you've solved the resolution problem, right? Because now you have full information about that time. So you've substituted the resolution problem, with its, which is very hard, with a very easy problem, which is fuzzy matching. And say that, yes, it matches one of the times that we proposed. If the person is referencing that time, then he's either accepting it or declining it, which is another simple binary decision, right? So that's breaking it down into this um, sort of very simple binary decisions that require very little context, improved our performance significantly, and it's something that we can do because we have context, because we live in the closed domain of scheduling meetings, right? And so that restricts the space of possibilities significantly, right? So that's when I was saying before that we don't want to be too ambitious. We want to, it's a singular domain project and that's why we think we can solve it. This is how then it plays, this is where that statement plays out. Okay, so what's the performance? This is uh, recall and precision as a function of time for some set of weeks uh, for last year. So each point here is the recall uh, and precision for a given week. And what I mean by recall and precision is the full thing, not just detecting it, but detecting it and resolving it into the right timestamp. So you can see we have about 85% uh, recall, which is good, could still be improved. The main drawback there is how noisy emails are. There's just all the different ways that people write the most bizarre things. And, but once we do get something and we resolve it, we get it right about 97 to 98% of the times. So how does this compare to uh, research out there? So you have to compare it to the strict detection, the strict detection column so there you can see that the recall uh, for other research of this type can exceed ours uh, a little bit. The best ones out there are around 89, 90%. Uh, 
but that's because they're training these things on corpuses where the temporal expressions are actually well defined. So they're not as noisy or anywhere as noisy as emails. But now look at the precision. The best precisions out there are around 93%, whereas we have 97%. And that's basically thanks to the fact that we can exploit context. So before I wrap up, let me say something about email classification. So this time entities example where we go through this binary tree, that then be itself, the output of that becomes features to our classifiers. For classifying emails, we take standard textbook approach. We do support vector machines, one's one versus all. We have a taxonomy of possible intents for emails, so possible types of emails that we could have. We train a separate SVM for each. Um, we do feature reduction through you know, standard methods like mutual information. We optimize the parameter space automatically, so we survey the whole parameter space for each SVM. And so then an email comes in, we hit it with our 70 or 100 SVMs, and then it returns the classes that that email belongs to. The type of features that we use, um, also standard NLP features, engrams. By the way, engram is um, sort of the origin of Amy Ingram's last name. Um, then we also use parts of speech tagging as features, syntax rules based on parts of speech tagging, the output of these decision trees that I was talking about, and context. Again, context helps us here quite a bit. Let me show you one example of performance of our email classifier. This is how well we're doing in terms of classifying emails that are new meeting requests. So an, an email comes in and we need to determine whether the guy is requesting a new meeting or he's talking about something else, maybe setting preferences, etc. cetera. Um, this is the precision and recall as a function of the confidence level. So the x-axis has nothing to do with time now. It's a confidence level. So you can see that for a confidence level of 0.9, for example, we get about 90% of the emails that come in uh, that are new meeting requests with a precision of around 97%. So that's OK, but we need to do significantly better. So this is a very active area of research in, in the company. So with that, uh, a little bit of future work. So there's three very exciting areas uh, that we're just sort of tapping into. We've already taken the first steps at them, but we want to go much deeper into them. One of them is uh, understanding people's calendars and calendar preferences automatically. So doing a bunch of pattern recognition, you know, what's your favorite time for meeting uh, for lunch, a business lunch, or where, this type of thing. Uh, we want to enhance our meeting location model, meaning that knowing certain things about you and your profile, we want to be able to suggest places for you to meet with people, and also take into account, in a better way than we're doing now, uh, travel time between, you know, for, to how long is it going to take you to get to the next meeting. And then we also want to extract relationships uh, of, of your meeting network. So we want to be able to deduce, you know, when you meet with these three people, you tend to meet in this place. This guy is actually your boss, so if he wants to meet with you at two, uh, that's going to take precedence over having coffee with your friend or something. So this type of thing. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I close the talk and open it for questions. And maybe now, actually, Nikhil and Angela who are full-time data scientists in my team. I wanted them to just join me, help me answer some of the questions. They're co-authored all this stuff, so. <laughs> so we use uh, Stanford NLP uh, parser and for the time detection stuff, we use two time. So it's all within Stanford, basically. But it's very, the way, our, so Stanford NLP gives us some sort of like seed of information, on top of which we add a bunch of logic layers. And that's actually a module in our system that we could very easily substitute with any other like NLTK or whatever other library you would want. So, <laughs> so it depends. Like, so right now we're collecting a lot of annotations. So the system automatically learns, like, based on the context of the previous uh, email that had come in. And like, usually, if 
it uh, identifies that most of the times whoever happens to be a PM it, because that's what you expect in business meetings. So this kind of uh, annotated history for the data helps. We have an internal team do it. Yeah. Oh yeah. So he's asking that was our our annotated data set the result of out, you know crowdsourcing this thing to Mechanical Turks? And the answer is no. We have an internal team, and part of the reason is that we there's an issue when you go to external Mechanical Turks of releasing or revealing sort of information that could be sensitive. So that, so that particular case we handle by pressing sort of like a snooze button, where we'll pick up, you told us, hey, leave me alone for a week, I, I don't know. And so we press a snooze button that then you'll be, the conversation with you will get picked up again next Monday, unless there's some pressing decision that needs to happen, because the meeting will happen before and we need to resolve it before that. Certainly, yeah. certainly. Yeah, we understand that that type of situation. Yeah. So I have a question. So uh, the, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, corporations use the exchange system. Yeah. And when you're booking meeting rooms, that's the first thing you do is you take the government booking meeting rooms to the services department. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, I see what you mean. So that's that's a very interesting and at the same time not too far fetched functionality that Amy could take on and that we've thought about. So we're yeah. So the answer will be yes in the near future. And I just uh, one follow up question. You said in the future you're gonna be applying uh, priority or weeks to individuals like your boss or Yes. Or yes. We're yeah, we're shooting for that. And for that we need to learn the relationships between the people that are having the meeting basically. So the rule-based system that we have is applied to a very limited, so a very specific problem, which is detecting temporal expressions. And temporal expressions are structured enough that having a rule-based system actually does quite well. Obviously, it's very hard for me to conceive that that couldn't be outperformed by machine learning. So I strongly suspect that we can outperform that with machine learning. You mean like what languages we use, etc.? So backend, Scala. So we're all Scala freaks. Uh, we use some Python for like exploration stuff. Um, database, MongoDB. The AWS. So can you repeat the question? Yeah. So I think the question is if uh, the email has a very short text, like if it's just two or three words, how do you detect what it means? So. So one of the uh, one of the strong features for us is the entire email thread. Like, for example, if it's the first email that comes in, it's very unlikely that it's going to be an accept time intention email, and like the likelihood of it being a new meeting is much higher. So, such context and the previous emails in the thread also help. So it's not just that one single sentence that we are looking at, but the entire history in the conversation. Yeah. So we. Yeah, 
So we use a bunch of context-based uh, features. So for example, what that email is responding to, right? So you could think of this as sort of like bootstrapping method, where if I know what the email, if I have full information about the, the preceding email, that actually informs quite a bit and restricts the space of possibilities of the current email. Yes, it's a pure bits decision tree. That's what it is. But it's just that I think it's it's that it's the effort to make each node in the decision tree a binary, a purely binary decision that is very, very context independent and is as just as simple as it possibly can be. Right? So we rather answer two hundred very simple questions than ten very complex questions. No, they're all machine learning based. Sorry? They're all machine learning, oh, all, machine. all of them. Well, some of them are not because they're purely uh, mechanical. You can deduce them deterministically from context. I think it was, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the first question was, uh, emails are, email bodies are accompanied with a lot of noisy stuff like signatures, disclaimers, etc. So a lot of, quite a bit of work goes into actually detecting and parsing the email out into these different pieces. For signature stripping, which is a classic problem, uh, we use um, actually SVMs to do that. So we have several handles to determine uh, what the signature, you know, if this part of the email is a signature or not, and if it is, then we have a whole model to handle that. But we don't discard it because actually signatures are quite information rich. So they tell us a lot of personal information about the person who's using the system, like his name, his office, his telephone, etc. So we, it's not like we discard it because this is very useful information in the context of a meeting. Right? Um, so that's the first question. And the second question is how do we make sure that we can handle, say, one million meetings going through our system? That's a purely engineering question, right? So we have QEs, we just spin up more instances in AWS, right? So you parallelize the process. That's it. No, but the email is, the, the, the SVM is trained offline. And then once you have the trained SVM, then you just have the little, you know, your hyperplane or whatever, and you just make the decision, making the, the, the prediction takes like a millisecond. Um, can you, I think I understand more or less what you're saying, but could you elaborate a little bit? Yes, yeah, so I have two email accounts, I have two email accounts, one for personal one. Oh, okay. So you have, to, you want to, you're thinking of two separate identities for Amy, in a sense. I mean, you can trick Amy into thinking that you're two different people, right? If, if that's what you mean. We haven't really developed a model for that, but it's, it's an interesting idea. <laughs> and when does Amy decide, should I ask a question or should I just take it? Right. Case? So for us, that's uh, the absolutely worst case scenario, right? Where we just have no idea and we're confused and we give up. And so then we need to request for clarification, which happens sometimes because people are, can be very ambiguous. with, And that's also people fool around with Amy quite a bit. Um, so there is that case where we either pipeline it to customer support or send back a request clarification type of email, but we try to avoid that. So our, our whole focus is to minimize that that type of uh, that type of case. So. so you use like a confidence threshold. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, <clears throat> oh, in that sense. So there's so there's two answers to your to your question, and I think and I know what you mean. But the first one is, we retain information on the users just for the sake of making the service better for them. So if you connected your calendar once, we're not going to keep you asking for your calendar every time. But that's not what you mean. I understand. Yeah, slang or language. I think it's a beautiful idea to try to customize Amy to each individual user that Amy, so sort of train Amy to understand a specific user as well as possible and, and even try to talk to that user in his own language. I think that's a, I think that's a beautiful idea, but the, we're not doing that right now. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> so happy that you asked that. So I think one of the sweet spots of Amy is, yeah, so the answer is yes, we can customize Amy for a specific corporation that has 20,000 employees. And imagine all of them, when they onboard the company, they get their Amy account. So now, typically when you schedule a meeting within a company, it's like, hey, uh, can you guys meet on this day? And there's a whole ping pong. And you get to know when the meeting's going to happen with those two people maybe a day or two afterwards. Whereas if everybody had Amy, and I was to request a meeting with you three, I would send out the meeting proposal and sort of magically and immediately we would all get a meeting invitation like seconds afterwards, which somehow maximizes all of our preferences, right? So that's really a sweet, sweet spot of Amy, I think. Yeah, we get that all the time. Oh, time zones are an absolute nightmare that we can't handle. But it has been through the a massive amount of pain. But yes, we've learned how to handle time zones. We do have uh, a way of handling uh, illogical cases, so things that don't make sense. I, I don't know if you wanted to elaborate. Were you going to say something? Things like 30th February or something like that, which makes no sense. Yeah, so if somebody says, let's meet on the 31st of February, we are capable of identifying that as a, an illogical time, and then we have two solutions. Either we try to guess what he actually meant and act on that and allow that person to correct us down the line if we're wrong, or to go back to the person and say, and try to just clarify, is, hey, we noticed that you proposed this, but is what you actually meant this? So developing that architecture, developing, understanding what that logic tree is, is the result of analyzing the data for a long time and understanding all the possible cases that we, all the possible scenarios that we have in meetings. So that's kind of the equivalent of we now have the car prototype. So we know all the different pieces and what talks to each other and what we can decouple, right? So that's what goes into the design of that logic tree. And so each step of the logic tree kind of reduces the, the space of possibilities that that thing can be. And so it's kind of narrowing down uh, and almost deterministically telling you where you are. Yeah. So that's also a good question. Um, that is a function of the number of people in the meeting as well. So if we're scheduling a meeting with two or three people, then Amy starts talking individually to each of them. So you talk individually, you negotiate with Amy, but now this guy rejected a time, and so that information needs to travel horizontally and affects the conversation with somebody else, right? So it's one-to-one. -one. Of course, that becomes sort of intractable if you go to meetings with more than five or six people, 
where now you, we adopt a different strategy where we maybe actually we're developing a model for that still, uh, but where we maybe talk to several people at the same time. And of course, we only talk to those people who are not using Amy, because those that are using Amy, then it's Amy talking to Amy internally, and we don't need to bother them for anything. So Amy acts as sort of like the interface between all the different conversations with different participants. Yeah, so Amy is waiting for the response of everybody, right? And so if that guy's responded already, then we we know the information for that person and we need to see whether that m the other person agrees with that or where that matches the other person or not, or not, right? So if the other person now rejects that time, that Amy needs to go back to this guy and say, hey, that time actually won't work. What about this other time? Or, but somet uh, sorry. or sometimes we uh, face a case where the second guy just doesn't reply and the first time actually becomes invalid. So that also triggers a response from Amy and she contacts the first person again and continues the conversation in that case. But there's a time pressure, right, which is the meeting time that the host wanted. And so as things get closer to the meeting time, we become more aggressive with the people, right, in a sense. <laughs>